Good morning and welcome. Thank you, Etienne. Before I get started, uh, we we have this day to uh, recognize our three graduates and the mothers who are letting them go. Wes, uh, Nister, and TJ, uh, we congratulate you on your accomplishments, and we look forward to, uh, to hearing good things. <clears throat> and to our mothers, in a world of selfishness and, and chaos, we have uh, consistency and love and sacrifice, and we can't thank you enough for what you do and what you mean to all of us. Um, and it is, it is the, the growing and maturing of children to someday send them off to be on their own. That is so scary and frightening. Um, but we have good parents, and you guys have done a good job. And so trust in God as you send your, your young ones out into the world. We studied the book of Hosea last week, and it brought us to the topic of marriage, which I know is, is near and dear to the hearts of many mothers uh, as well as, as to us all. Hosea got us looking at marriage as the relationship between God and his people. Hosea and God, the loving, faithful, sacrificing, redeeming husband. Gomer and the Israelites, the unfaithful, difficult, wounded, and yet redeemed wife. We see that marriage begins with God and his people. It's how God sees his relationship with us. And so we talked about that big picture relationship last, last Sunday, and I'd like to focus it down and to look at God's view of marriage today. There's a meaningful statement. There's a meaningful marriage statement that is made four times in Scripture. You may turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, talking about marriage. Jesus uh, repeats this teaching, this statement again in Matthew 19 and Mark 10 when the Pharisees ask him about divorce. And it is also repeated by Paul as Etienne read in Ephesians chapter 5. From Genesis, from the second chapter until near towards the end of the New Testament. This is a timeless teaching about marriage, this statement that we are about to read. It would have been the guide for marriage for Adam and Eve, the first couple. It would have been a marriage guide for Gomer and Hosea, the prophet and his unfaithful wife. And it is a guide for us today. The Bible does not often talk about marriage, and so when it repeats something four times, we ought to pay attention Genesis 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. <clears throat> marriage is a gift from God. Marriage is a gift. It's a gift from God, and it shows the world out there, and it shows us in here. It shows the world and the church the appropriate expression of things like commitment and love and intimacy between a man and a woman. You see, from the beginning, God made them man and woman. And he told the man to leave his father and mother, to hold fast to his wife, and for them to become one flesh. What's the first word in the marriage statement? Genesis chapter 2, 24. Therefore, right? Any of our grammarians in the audience know what part, of, what part of speech that is in English? It's an adverb which modifies a verb. If I am happy and I turn it into an adverb, I am happily, right? You add L-Y to make it into an adverb. It modifies. Therefore is, is sort of like saying according or accordingly. 
What have we just got done uh, doing if we had read Genesis 1 and 2? What has just happened here? This is creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And as the conclusion or the culmination or the final crescendo of creation, what does God give to his people? He gives them marriage. Therefore modifies every verb that, is, that we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. How is it modified? It's from God. When a young man and a young woman leave their mother and father to, to go start their own household, that's from God. When a young man and a young lady hold fast to one another in love, that's from God. When they unite together in one flesh, that is from God. Therefore, marriage is God's gift to a man and a woman. It is from Him. You know, the, the Pledge of Allegiance, as I spend time in the schools, I say the pledge quite often, right? One nation under God. Do you remember that phrase when you had said the pledge, right? In that same sense, in that same sense marriage is under God. It is God's gift to us. I don't know, we don't have an exact description of what Gomer and Hosea's marriage day would have looked like. But if it is anything like Jewish marriage has been for centuries and centuries and centuries, the two of them would have stood amongst all of their family, surrounded by their family. But the two of them would have been underneath this sort of tent. Numbers chapter 15. We have to go to Numbers 15 to understand what this tent was made of. They would take this, this shawl or this prayer shawl or this, uh, this thing that the Jews would wear and they would drape it above the, the couple that was to be married. Now, what are the origins of this tent that they would, that they would stand underneath? It, it comes from Numbers 15, verse 37. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corner of their garments throughout their generations. So God says, You're going to be wandering in the desert, and I want you to remember me, and so make these garments that have tassels on them. The end of verse 38. Put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner, and it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them, not to follow after your own heart or your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. So you shall remember and do all my commandments and be holy to your God. They would wear these garments, men and women, and they had these tassels, and it reminded them that God is watching over everything that they do. God is blessing the things that they do. And so along in the tradition of, of Jewish marriage, they took this prayer shawl and they said, you know what, God gave us marriage. And so let's put a couple underneath this prayer shawl as they get married. Marriage is from God. And like any good tent, you have to have some pillars to hold it up. A man leaving his father and his mother. A man holding fast to his wife and then becoming one. Those are the three pillars of marriage. This, this tent that God has created for a couple to live in. Does that analogy work for you? A marriage tent? Right? For us guys, it's that rugged, manly image, adventure in the woods. But there's also the cozy side to the tent, right? You have the nice campfire and there's warmth. And there's comfort there. From the beginning, marriage is a gift from God, showing couples how to express their commitment, the leaving, their holding fast, the love, and becoming one flesh, intimacy. Let's start out with the, the, first, the first pillar, the first stake, the first part that God has given. A man shall leave his father and his mother. Now, there was the whole wedding party, right? They were standing around, and Homer, Gom Homer, I knew that was going to come out. I told myself not to say that. You put Hosea and Gomer together, and you get Homer, who wrote the Iliad, right? <laughs> Hosea and Gomer 
would stand under the tent. There would be two people under this tent, and the family would be surrounded, leaving of the father and the mother. This is the public or legal aspect of marriage. Now, back in those days, and we see this in Matthew 25, which is a, a bigger description of a Jewish wedding, but the, the, the husband would leave his house, after already building an attachment to his father's house, he would leave his house and travel to the bride's house, and he would, he would get the bride, picking up friends and, and folks along the way, and they would go back to his hometown, and they would then start their household attached to the household of, of his family. A wife would leave her family to live with her husband. Can you see any problem here moving in with your, with your in-laws? Now, before I go any further, I love my mother-in-law because, well, I think she did a good job raising my wife. And I'm thankful for her job of, of, raising, of raising my wife. Mothers, give us what we need in order to go out and leave and to be on our own. But, with that said, can you see a mother-in-law problem perhaps forming in this situation? Why God crafted this phrase in this way? Okay. It's one thing if as Hosea was growing up, you know, his mother folded his socks when he was a little boy and, and made his meals and maybe helped him count out his, his money. But now Hosea brings his wife home and who, can his mom still fold his socks for him? Can his mom still cook his meals for him? Can his mom manage his money for him? Can his mother raise his children for him? Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother. Leaving is, is both an act. It's the public act of this couple coming together saying, we are starting our own household. But it's also a process of this husband and wife learning to make decisions on their own. Have you ever been in an argument with your spouse? Or maybe you've heard, right? We, we'll just get that out there. We've all had arguments, right, as married people. Have you ever been in an argument and you're like, wait a minute, is this between me and you or is this between me and you and whoever else you're going to tell this to? Is this between me and you and your mother? Or, or is this between me and you and my father? Right? Have you ever been in those kind, of, those kind of arguments where it's not just the two of you? That's the process of leaving, is the two of you learning to live and to get along and to make your own household. Now, let's go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Because God has a purpose in the leaving that is necessary, but it is not leaving in a lurch. It is not abandoning or ignoring forevermore. 1 Timothy chapter 5, starting in verse 3. Honor widows who are truly widows, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. Paul is saying, Timothy, you've got to teach the people this. Okay? The, the children and the grandchildren must have their own household because it is only when they are their own self-sufficient household that someday they can give some return to their own parents. If the, if the children are always dependent upon their parents, then what help are they going to be in times of need? That's godliness. Leaving and coming up with, and developing your own household. Go down to verse 8. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. You see, the wedding is more than merely a formality. We read about weddings all the times in all the time in the supermarket newspapers, right? Some celebrity had their 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 big fat Greek wedding, right? Um, some celebrity had their famous wedding, but you know it always seems to fall apart. You know why? There's too many people under the tent. It's not just the two of them. It's everybody, even me, as I buy my milk. I don't want to be in on that. But here I am. There's too many people there. 
The wedding is more than a formality, and it can be sad. There's tears of joy, but there's a letting go, and there is sadness. The, the dad is going to be sad, but especially the mother, right? Because she's sending these children away. She has given them the things they need to succeed, and yet they must let them go so that they can become their own household. Part of the gift, part of the marriage tent, right? One of the stakes that holds it up is to leave one's family and to commit to building a new life. Only by a full separation can there be full maturity on the part of the new bride and her new husband. So there's the, the ceremony, the wedding, that, that, that public leaving, and then the continuation of that. But they would also be exchanging vows. They would also be exchanging uh, their commitment to hold fast to one another. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. You can't leave unless you're intending on holding fast. And you can't really hold fast until you have left. The leaving is more of the public pronouncement and the public aspect. The holding fast is more of the personal side. Now, very literally, the holding fast that we read about in Genesis and in the Gospels and in Ephesians means to stick together. You take, you take two bricks and, and, and you use mortar to stick them together, right? They're still two bricks, but they have become something more than just the two. They're stuck together. And you know what? You cannot separate those bricks without doing damage. That's the question that Jesus addresses in Matthew 19 and in Mark 10. The Pharisees come and they say, well, what about divorce? Moses let them. And he said, what God has put together, let not man separate. Now, he says, let not man separate it. You can still separate that. But those two bricks will be forever scarred by what happens. Now, let me pause for a moment because I can't the Christian world has not fully understood what to do with divorce, let alone me and the two minutes I have on this topic here. For those of you preparing for marriage or those of you in marriage, you've got to fight for your marriage like the doctor who fights for the patient on the doctor's bed. You have to fight for that. If you've experienced divorce in your life, there is the tent of God that you can crawl into, and there is healing, and there is forgiveness, and God is, is there for that. That's all I can say about that aspect of it right now. But God intends that these two are to stick, to adhere, like two bricks mortared together, like two pieces of paper glued together. That's the literal Hebrew of what's going on here. What does that mean when it comes to being married? Nothing in the husband's life can be closer to him than his wife. What can he hold closer than his bride? Can he hold his job closer than he does his bride? How about his hobbies? Can he hold those things closer than he does his wife? What about another relationship? A best friend or, or, or some colleague from work? Holding fast means that the, the wife is the person he holds closest above all others. There's the brick, there's the brick, and there's the mortar. And it's the husband and the wife, and there's nothing else in between there. Now what about the wife? Same thing for her. She must adhere to the husband closer than any other relationship. That includes work if she works. It includes her family. It also includes the children. It's one of the hardest things for people in my age bracket is your husband and wife and then you have a kid and suddenly you start to hold fast to that child more than to each other and you go through married life and the kids leave and suddenly the kids are gone and you've stopped holding fast to each other and there's nothing left in the relationship. Now this isn't a hard and fast rule, but there was a preacher who said, you know, in an effort to avoid this, my wife was the first person I greeted when I would come home from a day at work. Then he would greet the children. But his priority was always to hold fast to his wife above all others. 
Now, why is this not love? Why doesn't it say to leave your father and mother and to love? How many different ways can you use the word love? I love pizza. I love my job. How about when you were in junior high and you love that person? Aren't you glad you're not still holding on to them? No offense if you married your junior high sweetheart. <laughs> this isn't just a reaching or groping love that is just struggling to satisfy. This is a love that makes a conscious decision, like Hosea being told to marry Gomer and Christ being told to hold fast to the church. It was a conscious decision to hold on. And it is not without crisis. Love is not without crisis. Love is not without hard words. Now, I didn't say harsh words. Love ought not to have harsh words. But it isn't without hard words. Christ had some hard things to say to the church. It is not without hard work and sacrifice. You know, when the church turned its back on Christ, what did he do? He sacrificed and he stood there knocking at the door waiting to offer forgiveness always ready to forgive. Part of the gift, part of the tent is holding fast to one's spouse closer than anyone or anything. It's making those precious vows from so many years ago, or perhaps from just a few years ago, making them a reality each and every day and refusing to walk away. Hosea and Gomer would have stood underneath this prayer shawl and they would have made the public pronouncement and they would have made the personal vows to one another and then they would take the prayer shawl and they would take it to you know where they would take it next they would take it and they would drape it over the wedding chamber right where they were to spend their first night together yes God oversees the wedding, God oversees the holding fast, and he even oversees the intimacy that a husband and wife share. After the vows have been given, and after the garment was, was moved to the bedchamber, within the security and protection of the wedding, after having vowed to hold fast to one another and to hold close, after those two things were completed, then the couple could enjoy the physical aspect of marriage. No secrecy, no hiding, no guilt, no worry that this person is someday going to run off because they have committed. No comparison over, well, there's all these people I've been with in the past and I wonder if I'm going to be good enough. And you know what they could say? If we don't get this physical, if this, this intimacy, if we don't get it right tonight, guess what? We have the rest of our lives to learn and to grow and to share and to become one together. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. This is something that's difficult for us to talk about, intimacy. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This becoming one, this sharing, this intimacy is just as important to God as the public wedding and the personal vows made to one another. It is an equal third pillar of marriage. It's more than just the physical aspect. It is a sharing. It is a sharing of emotions. It's a sharing of our, our finances and our debts, of our dreams and our fears, of our work and our hobbies. It's not becoming the same, but it's taking our two unique personalities and sharing them with each other. You may have different personalities and different interests and different things that you do, but you have to share them. And a husband and wife share so much so that they share their bodies with one another. How are you talking about your sexuality? How are we as a church about talking about this with one another? How about your spouse? Can you share with your spouse your, your desires and your needs? Boy, it's hard, isn't it? Let's take a step back. How about talking with our children about these things? 
Is that challenging? Is that hard? It's a difficult thing. Sometimes we think it's, it's, so, it's so holy that maybe we can't come close to it or, or, or maybe it's so difficult to talk about that sometimes we left it unsaid. But who is going to discuss the gift of sex that God has given us if not us, if not the church? I'll tell you who's going to. It's going to be Hollywood. It's going to be romance novels. It's going to be those magazines that you see when you're at the grocery store. They are giving us a message about sexuality. Is that what you want your children to follow and to, to know about? Is that where you want them to get the lessons? Who else is going to discuss this wonderful gift in a reverent and respectful manner, if not the church? It's hard, but we have to try. Part of the gift, part of the tent of marriage is within this realm of intimacy. And it's something that has grown into and that involves trust and forgiveness and throughout our lives, hopefully, fulfillment. We can't cover everything about marriage in a, where am I at now, 30 minute sermon, 25 minutes. If marriage is such an art, then the perfect marriage must be really hard. Well, join the club because there is no perfect marriage. If you want a surefire way to keep your virtuousness in perspective, then I suggest you get married because it's going to keep you humble. There's always some aspect of that triangle, of that marriage tent that you're going to have to work on. The sharing and, and, and the commitment and the intimacy, there's always going to be something that needs to be worked on. It keeps us humble. Here's what God would have us do. Not walk out of here hanging our heads about where we struggle in our marriage. I think he wants each of us, if you are married, this is messages for you, to talk with your spouse about the things you are doing that is making your tent strong. What area are you strong in? Share that with your spouse. And then also share with them, here's something that we could work on. Can we work on that together? If you are not yet married, then, then think on the life that you live. Is it preparing in those three aspects for a strong and healthy marriage? Or are you hurting that opportunity? Brothers and sisters, the greatest gift of all that we have is Christ Jesus, who left his heavenly father in heaven, who left his, his mother on this earth to sacrifice for us. Christ holds fast to the church. He keeps us closer than anything else, offering us forgiveness. And he shares with us in his death and in his burial and in his resurrection. You know, Christ was a single man. And so you don't have to be married to live a fulfilled life in God because you can go and be with God and, you, and you, can be, uh, you can be married to him and you can crawl into his tent and you can be surrounded by his love and his forgiveness. If you need to do that or you need to come back to that, then now is the time for you to make that known. But God has also given a gift for those who marry. A gift that compels us to believe in God because it is an image of God's love for us. We leave our families to establish our own. We hold fast to our spouse above all other, and we become one in everything, reflect, reflecting God's love for his church. If you need to respond in any way to this message, come forward while we stand and sing.